Man, the part of the chapter that I'd like to focus on is beginning in verse 11 where the Bible reads, There's a generation that curseth their father and does not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Title of my sermon tonight is The Baby Boomer Generation. The Baby Boomer Generation. Baby Boomers are the demographic group born during the post-World War II baby boom, approximately between the years 1946 and 1964. This includes people who are between 53 and 71 years old at this time. They have also been known as the me generation. They are a generation of spoiled brats that rebelled against their parents and perverted a whole nation. Now let me start out by saying this. If you're a baby boomer tonight, or if you know of a pastor that's a baby boomer, that's a godly pastor, obviously I'm not preaching against you. Obviously I'm not preaching against him. Obviously we're generalizing about a generation. In every generation, there are gonna be 7,000 men that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. So this sermon is in no way intended to be disrespectful to godly men and women that are in that generation of being around 55 to 70 years old. But in general, the baby boomer generation is a wicked generation. The reason why this is important to talk about today in 2017 is that this is the generation that's in leadership now. This is the generation that's running our government. This is the generation that is pastoring the churches. These are the elders that people are looking up to and looking to for guidance spiritually, politically, and in other areas. And so we need to understand that the baby boomer generation in general is not a role model for us. It's not a generation that we want to follow. Those in the younger generation, such as myself, we need to reject the example of the baby boomer generation and we need to rebuild the old waste places and walk in the old paths wherein is the good way and not be part of that stiff-necked generation as the generation of our fathers. The baby boomers were the dope-smoking, long-haired hippies responsible for the sexual revolution, no-fault divorce, in their generation, abortion, sodomy, false Bible versions, the 1960s and the 1970s when the baby boomers were reaching adulthood were some of the most wicked times culturally in our country when our country really went down the toilet spiritually. They were spoiled rotten. The baby boomer generation were the generation that received peak levels. And when we say peak levels, we mean more than the generation before and more than the generation after. They received peak levels of income. They had the most money, the most prosperity, and they could therefore reap the benefits of abundant levels of food, clothing, retirement programs, and sometimes even midlife crisis products. The increased consumerism for this generation has been regularly criticized as excessive. A generation that was spoiled rotten. A generation that benefited from an artificially inflated economy after World War II. You see, the financial conditions in the United States of America in the 1950s and the 1960s were not normal. They were actually inflated because of the fact that, of course, Europe is all burned down and bombed and destroyed from World War II. 70 million people dead all the carnage and destruction and horrors of World War II, the United States came out of that looking pretty good, right? Totally undamaged. We've got all the manufacturing. We've got the resources. We've got the money. We made out great from World War II. And so we were thriving on this post-war boom that obviously couldn't last forever. So there was an artificial level of prosperity in the 50s and 60s. Not because the people in America were so righteous, but because they're benefiting our fair. Okay, so therefore, yeah, they're doing great financially. So they grew up with everything handed to them, everything easy, 
comparatively speaking to the generation before that went through the Great Depression and hard times and the generation after known as Generation X. So the baby boomers by nature are a spoiled rotten generation. This is why they rebelled against their parents. This is why they brought about the summer of love. And let me tell you something, the summer of love was not the summer of love because love is when we love God and keep his commandments and love thy neighbor as thyself. Right. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. No, it was the summer of filth, the summer of fornication, the summer of bastard children, the summer of wickedness. Amen. It's what it ought to be called. Not the summer of love. It's the summer of debauchery, summer of fornication, summer of adultery, summer of drugs, summer of frying your brain, summer of LSD, summer of dope and fools. It's not nothing to be glorified. Woodstock, the Monterey Pop Festival. These aren't cool things. These are things that destroyed the morals of a generation. Nudity, sodomy, filth, fornication. These ideas need to be rejected. Number one, the baby boomers were a spoiled, rotten generation that rebelled against their parents and perverted our nation. Number two, the baby boomers do not represent the old paths. Go, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. A lot of people get confused in 2017 because when they hear terms like the old paths, they assume that the old people are the ones following the old paths, but sadly, that is not the case. The reality is that the baby boomer generation is a liberal generation. They're not conservative. They don't represent the old fashioned principles, old paths living. They're actually more liberal than the young people. They're more liberal than those in their 30s and 40s. Ironically, because you'd expect old people to be old fashioned or conservative. But yet, if you look at your average old person, and again, of course, there are exceptions to this, but the old people that are from that baby boomer generation, they're the first ones to embrace sodomy. I mean, look, I was at the airport a couple months ago. Remember, Paul, wh where were we going, Paul, when that happened? What, what were we doing there? Verity? We were going to Verity Baptist? No, we're going to, Va yeah, Vancouver, that's what we did. Yeah, I, I went to uh, Vancouver, Washington to preach, and I'm at the airport in Phoenix, and I'm sitting next to this elderly lady, you know, but she's from this baby boomer generation, you know, this 65, 70-year-old lady. And I'm sitting next to her at the airport, and you expect somebody that's been around that long and that's from a time when things were more normal to have a brain in their head. But I'm talking to this lady, and, you know, all of a sudden, she just starts just telling us how we need to embrace. So Paul just got up and walked away like, oh, man, I'm going to go get some coffee. But <laughs> she's just telling us how we need to embrace sodomy and, and, and how homosexuality is fine. And she went to a sodomite wedding, and it was the most beautiful thing, and it brought tears to her eyes. Wow. And I told this woman, no. I rebuked this woman and started preaching the word of God to her. Uh, the people sitting around us, a bunch of baby boomers, started telling me, hey, you can't talk like that. This is a public place. And I said, you know what? I can say whatever I want. I said, if she can cram this, this homosexual filth down my throat, then I can speak the word of God. And I said, I don't remember asking your opinion anyway. Right. I don't remember inviting you into this conversation. You know, I'm just trying to go about my business. This old baby boomer woman wants to cram this filth down my throat. And then I start speaking the word of God and I had what, four or five people gang up against me telling me, you can't talk like that. You can't do that. Yeah, I, can, I just did. Amen. Because you know what? My generation is not going to follow your filthy ways if I have anything to do about it. And we are going to stand on the old paths where it is the good way and we're going to walk therein. And I don't care what the baby boomer generation did. I want to turn this thing around in my generation. Amen gonna follow that that garbage they want to shut me up no you shut up baby boomer and yeah. you say oh you respect your elders well the Bible says the hoary head is a crown of glory 
if it be found in the way of righteousness. But there's no fool like an old fool. And you know what? If some 55, 65, 75 year old person is going to come to me and preach Sodom and Gomorrah's teachings, then I will stand up to them and tell them, no! I'm just going to sit there and say, oh, well, you're old. You're old, so just say whatever filthy, blasphemous thing you want, and I'll just sit here and listen to you blaspheme God and blaspheme Christ and teach that the worst filth and perversion is wonderful and they should be brought into church in the form of a wedding ceremony, and I'm going to sit here and respect you because you're old. Wrong. Not going to happen. Amen. Because you know what? I respect God and his word above this baby boomer generation because when you start embracing wickedness and sin you lost my respect I don't care how old you are Amen. I don't care how old you are you know some old fart came into our church in Botswana he was a homosexual I grabbed him and physically dragged him out and threw him out of the building Amen. oh how dare you treat your elders that way hey if he's a homo he's ejected Amen. Not, you know it doesn't matter you say, well, respect your elders. Look, I do respect my elders until they start preaching lies. Until they start preaching. So Look, I don't care how old Cain is. God doesn't respect his offering. It doesn't, if Cain was, was 35 or 135, God wasn't going to respect false religion. God wasn't going to respect sodomy and filth. We need to understand that elders are to be respected by default. But when they start teaching lies and wickedness and perversion and filth, at that point, they've just lost respect right there. They've lost their right to be respected. It's not just a carte blanche that says, oh, we just always respect our elders no matter what they say. I mean, how old's Charles Manson? Did he just die? Didn't he die recently or is he still alive? Somebody help me out. How old is he? Huh? Oh, he's 85, so I guess if he walks in the room, I better treat him with respect, stand up, take my hat off to him, or what? No, because people like that, they've actually, they've actually forfeited their right to any respect at that point. Okay? So the bottom line is, the baby boomer generation does not represent the old past. And the reason this is confusing is because they're old. And they have gray hair, so it's easy to just look at them and assume... Okay, this is the old paths. If we find a preacher who's 55, 65 years old, they're going to be old-fashioned. We can learn from them and sit at their feet. But actually, if we sit at their feet, we're usually going to learn wickedness, liberalism, permissiveness that came out of the 60s and 70s. That's the kind of garbage you're typically going to learn from grandma and grandpa today, unfortunately. Now, if you have a grandma and grandpa that are righteous, thank God for it. And I'm not criticizing them. Again, I'm not stereotyping all baby boomers, but I'm telling you that in general, because the baby boomer generation has taken our country down this wicked path, you can't just assume that grandma and grandpa are going to steer you right. Because nowadays, grandma and grandpa that's a baby boomer will often sit you down and teach you lies and teach you wickedness and tell you to embrace all of the world's filth and perversion and give you advice that contradicts scripture. Right. Look, when Jehoshaphat's mother started bringing idolatry into the kingdom, he didn't just say, oh, well, I got to honor my father. You know what he did? He deposed her from being the queen. He took her idol away from her. He called it Nehushtan and he destroyed it. You know, he's because God's not a respecter of persons when it comes to sin and wickedness. So the hoary head is a crown of glory. We should respect those who are older, but it's a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. So if we have a godly elder, we should respect our godly elders, or at least if they're just a neutral elder. But when they're on a path of perversion, They've, they've, they've forfeited the right to, to anyone's respect at that point. Now, one of the tendencies of the baby boomers, because they grew up in kind of a spoiled environment, and again, I'm speaking in generalities, and if you would go to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, one of the tendencies of the baby boomers is that they tend to love luxury, comfort, security, prosperity, not taking any risks and getting along with everybody. It's like they want to have a really comfortable, easy, cush 
kind of a lifestyle. That's the tendency with that baby boomer generation. That's how they generally are. So the problem with a lot of pastors from that generation is they don't want to endure any kind of persecution. They don't want to take any risks. They don't, you don't see them preaching controversial messages like the, the previous generation, the generation of the Great Depression era, they preached controversial sermons. They preached hard on sin. My generation contains people that are preaching hard on sin. But amongst the baby boomer generation, it's rare to find a preacher that will preach a controversial sermon. It's rare that they'll kind of stick their neck out, go out on a limb, preach hard. They tend to want to play it safe. They like to play it safe. They want to take the comfortable route. They don't want to make any waves. They want to get along. They want to have security, prosperity, safety. But the problem with that is that the Bible says that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The Bible tells us that we should walk by faith, not by sight. That we should not lay up treasures for ourselves upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but that rather we should lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. And the baby boomer generation tends to be a generation that doesn't want to live by faith at all. They don't want to step out in faith. They don't want to lay it all on the line. Like we talked about this morning in the sermon, realizing that all that trust in the Lord are not going to be ashamed. You know, God's going to come through for them. It's like they don't believe that. They want the safety net. They want the big bank account. They want the comfortable retirement. They want to make sure not to preach anything that's going to upset the apple cart in their church. So they tend to be a watered down generation of preachers, unfortunately. Now, are there exceptions to this? Yes. And if any baby boomer is hearing this sermon, what you ought to do is think about these tendencies and say, well, I'm going to make sure that's not me. I'm going to make sure to be different. But that's the tendency with the baby boomer generation, a non-risk-taking, comfortable, complacent generation. Complacent, meaning that they're just kind of comfortable and happy where they're at. They don't want to push it. They don't want to work hard and do something big. They'd rather coast and just kind of enjoy, you know, their twilight years, as it were, in this time. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. For out of prison he cometh to reign, whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. This leads to my next point. Number three, the baby boomers tend to not care about the next generation. They tend to be focused on themselves and they don't tend to care about the next generation, their children and grandchildren. It doesn't really matter that much to them. See here, the Bible talks about an old and foolish king showing that just because you're old doesn't mean you're wise. An old and foolish king who won't be admonished. He won't listen to hard preaching. He won't correct anything. He just wants to continue being set in his foolish ways. And the Bible says, He that is born in his kingdom becometh poor, meaning that he does not do good unto the next generation. The poor wise child is better than he. God has more respect for a poor wise child than an old and foolish child. King, because being old does not just automatically get you respect. You know, if you're old and you've been a prostitute your whole life, that's not a respectable person. Because the hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. Go, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 39. This is a great example of the baby boomer mentality. Hezekiah was like unto a baby boomer in this sense. While you're turning to Isaiah 39, let me read for you some things about the baby boomer generation. People often take it for granted that each succeeding generation will be better off than the one before it. When Generation X came along just after the boomers, they would be the first generation to enjoy a lesser quality of life than the generation preceding it. So basically in our country, 
the levels of prosperity have continually gotten better over time where each generation would be better off and it was kind of assumed that each generation would be better off than the generation before. Whereas the baby boomer generation is the first generation to leave things worse to the next generation, which is known as Generation X. The way this is usually broken down is the baby boomer generation and then what's known as Generation X, which is people that are born in the mid-1960s to the late 70s. And then my generation, I was born in 1981. I'm kind of at the very beginning of the so-called millennial generation. Now look, sure, I could do a whole sermon about the problems of the millennial generation or the problems of Generation X, but you know why the millennial generation is so screwed up? Because it was raised by the baby boomer generation. Well, yeah, with, with, with a bunch of, you know, thank God I had godly parents, but with a bunch of wicked parents, of course the millennial generation is, is lazy and doesn't want to work. When they were raised by the spoiled brats of the baby boomer generation. See, the baby boomers right now, like I said, they're a spoiled generation. They control over 80% of personal financial assets, more than half of all consumer spending in the United States. They buy 77% of all prescription drugs, 61% of over-the-counter drugs, and 80% of all leisure travel or travel for pleasure is done by that baby boomer generation. So it's a financially prosperous generation. And a survey found that nearly one-third of baby boomers polled in the United States would prefer to pass on their inheritance to charities rather than to pass it down to their children. So one third of the baby boomers, they don't even want to leave anything to their children. They don't even love their children and even want to give them anything. They'd rather just donate it to charity. They don't even want to see their kids even end up with it. You know, which, you know, you say, well, maybe it's because their kids are wicked. Yeah, but they raised them that way. The Bible says, on the other hand, in Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. So, you know, these people, they have a mentality that doesn't care about the next generation. You know, at this point, we could talk about politics because we could talk about the fact that there's $20 trillion of national debt. Who racked it up? Who's racking it up? It's not my generation that racked it up. It's not my debt. You know, I'm born into this generation that's just spiraling in debt because the previous generation wanted to eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die, rack up this crazy debt, and then just make sure that my prescription drugs keep coming, make sure my social security checks keep coming, make sure I get paid and drugged until the bitter end, and then you know what? When I'm gone, nuts to you, young people. But the problem is we're going to have to inherit the world that they are creating for us right now. Right. We're the ones that are going to inherit it. Now, I'm not worried about the national debt because money is not the most important thing in this world. What I'm worried about is the spiritual inheritance that's being left behind by the baby boomers, not the financial problem. Yeah, they're leaving us a financial mess for sure. What about the spiritual problems? Look, those bunch of baby boomers that fill Congress and fill the Senate right now, they just keep raising that debt ceiling. Just borrow more money, borrow more money. Kick the can down the road for the next generation to pay for it. Me, you. Here's the baby boomer mentality of not caring about the next generation. Isaiah 39, verse 5. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, they shall take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, good. It's like, what? What? Hey, your son's going to be a eunuch. Your son's going to be castrated. Your grandson's going to have no stones. He's going to be a slave. He's going to lose everything. He's going to go into captivity. Good. Good. Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. He said, moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. I mean, look at that attitude. 
Hey, I mean, there's peace and truth in my days. So what? Go, if you would, to 2 Kings 20, verse 16. Is that someone who loves his son? Is that someone who cares about the next generation? Is that someone who's trying to leave the country or the world a little better when they leave than when they got there? Or is it somebody who just doesn't give a rip Is it the me generation that just says, well, as long as I'm cared for and drugged and paid for till the bitter end, nuts to you. And by the way, whatever money I do have, let me just give that to charity because I don't even want my kids or grandkids to even see any of it because I don't care about them at all. Even what I have, I'd rather just give it to someone else. Just get rid of it. The Bible says in 2 Kings 20, verse 16, And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house, and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day. Notice, he received an inheritance. Do you see that? Hezekiah received an inheritance that his fathers had laid up. Okay? So they had prospered and laid up wealth. They passed that on to Hezekiah, that inheritance. Everything that's been passed on to you, Hezekiah, everything that's been handed to you, everything that was given to you, everything that your parents and grandparents worked so hard to give you, you spoiled little brat, everything that was given to you in this country is going to be carried away into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. There's going to be nothing left. Verse 18, And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs. In the palace of the king of Babylon, then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good! Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. He said, Isn't it good? Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? Listen to what he's saying. Well, I mean, isn't it good? I mean, whoa, I don't get it. I mean, why would this be bad news? Why the long face, Isaiah? It's good. Because of course it's good as long as there's peace and truth in my days. This is a selfish, wicked mentality that doesn't care about the next generation. I believe this is the mentality of the baby boomer preachers in our, in our country today. Because I don't care about money. Listen, I don't care about getting a financial inheritance from my parents. I don't even want it. I don't need it. It's symbolic. It's symbolic, folks. What I want to inherit from my parents is a spiritual heritage. David said, the lines are fallen unto me in, the ple in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. He said, the Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. You know, the best thing you can inherit is the Lord. Amen. Right, right. The best you can inherit is the King James Bible. The best thing you can inherit is the doctrines of salvation by faith. The best thing that you can inherit is fundamentalism. It's Christianity. It's the Bible. It's the teachings of this book. It's the sayings of Jesus Christ. It's a church that's a soul-winning church. That's what you want to inherit from the previous generation. That's what really matters. You know, if you seek first the kingdom of God, all the other things will be added unto you anyway. So what you need is wisdom, knowledge, understanding, godliness from the previous generation. This story is symbolic. Obviously, it literally happened, but it has another symbolic meaning on top of it that says that Hezekiah did not care about passing anything on of value to the next generation. As long as everything's cool while he's around, he doesn't mind if everything goes to hell in a handbasket after he's gone. And he doesn't mind even if his descendants are completely castrated. You know, and I see the baby boomer generation of preachers today, they don't seem to care that their grandson is, is virtually castrated, tantamount castrated because he's so effeminate as hell, they don't even care. They don't care about all the little pink shirt wearing pansies that they're putting out of their Christian schools and Bible. They don't care because if they cared, they'd stand up and start preaching hard and take some risks and go out on a limb, and fight sin, and fight the devil, and preach hard, but instead, they want to just prosper. They want to prosper. I don't want to prosper at the expense of my children. I don't want to prosper and be comfortable 
and succeed personally if it means compromising the spiritual future of my children and grandchildren. I'd rather preach hard on sin and cause problems for myself, but have my children grow up and walking in the ways of the Lord and in the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, not in candy land of the Lord. From all the sugary sweet sermons with no savory meat on the bone type Bible teaching, no bitter hard preaching, the bitter herbs of the hard teachings of the Bible. You know, I want to make sure that my kids get a balanced diet. And if it means that I'm persecuted, so be it. If it means I'm hated and reviled, so be it. If it means people get up and walk out of the church, so be it. Because it's not about me, it's about them. It's about them hearing what they need to hear. Not what they want to hear, what they need to hear. The baby boomer generation, be in, their, in their zeal to not be controversial, in their zeal to get along with the mayor and the congressman and all their other little boomer buddies, they are willing to throw the next generation under the bus. They don't even care that they're eunuchs, that they're a spiritual eunuch. Go, if you would, to uh, 1 Kings chapter 16. This is a story that that I think epitomizes what our Baptist preachers are doing today. You see, every generation is filled with preachers, right? There are thousands of Baptist preachers in America today, and there are thousands more scattered all over the world. There are 6,000 independent fundamental Baptist churches in America alone that are King James Bible, that only. That's only counting the ones that are King James only. Independent Baptists, over 6,000. So there's a multitude of preachers today, aren't there? And then all throughout the world, there's even more than that. That's not even counting Southern Baptists or other denominations or, 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 or independent Baptist churches that are not King James only or, or something like that. I mean, just the ones that we would consider, okay, at least they're King James only, independent fundamental Baptists, 6,000. Every generation has a multitude of prophets of the Lord, preachers of the Lord, but... In addition to that, there are also certain leaders that rise up in each generation. You know, men like Elijah or Elisha or John the Baptist or the apostles. Just throughout the Bible, there are certain men who are major leaders in that they don't just lead a local congregation, but actually other people are looking to them and they, they have a bigger scope of influence. That's just the nature of of the world that we live in. That's just the way that life is, right? There are going to be leaders. Somebody's going to lead. Somebody's going to be a voice that people listen to. And that can be a voice for good or that can be a voice for evil. Now, it goes the same way amongst independent fundamental Baptists. You know, there are certain preachers that other preachers look to as role models, even though we're all independent even though there's no formal connection between any of us, even though there's no financial ties and, and really people can do whatever they want. And there are various different crowds and camps, you know, within the independent Baptist universe, but there are certain leaders. Well, well here's the thing about that, is that today the leadership of the typical independent fundamental Baptist movement is a baby boomer leadership. Because the guys who are over 70 now, most of them have go either gone on to be with the Lord or they've retired or scaled back. You know, most of that generation, the generation before the baby boomer generation, has passed off the scene either by retiring or they've gone on to be with the Lord, etc. So what we're left with is that our, our oldest preachers who are usually pastoring the bigger churches because they've been around longer, they've been around for 30, 40 years, and people kind of look to these guys as elders. You know, they look to them as role models. They look to them as leadership. It's a baby boomer leadership today in the Independent Fundamental Baptist Movement, and the sad thing is that that leadership is a soft, watered-down leadership like we've been describing, and therefore churches are wrongfully following their lead instead of realizing that just because they're old 
And just because they pastor a big church, because it's been around for 30, 40 years, doesn't mean that that's a role model for us to follow. Okay, we need to understand that the old prophet, and if you, where, where did I have you turn? 1 Kings 16? We're going to get to the old prophet in 1 Kings 13 in a moment. But before we do, you know, we'll look at 1 Kings 16. But here's the thing. I feel like the independent fundamental Baptist leaders, the main leaders today, because of their me generation, selfish, compromise, not wanting to make any waves, more concerned with the stability of their own lives and retirement than on what's going to happen after they're gone, they're throwing the younger generation under the bus. A perfect example of this is what I preached about on Wednesday night. Now, I'm not going to re-preach my sermon from Wednesday night. And if you weren't here, you could download that sermon, you know, on Jeremiah chapter 39, that where I preached about the eunuchs and I preached about ebed Melech, and I talked about this, this wicked doctrine that's out there. But this is just one example. I mean, we could go on with other examples. This is just one example. And I'm going to park, I'm going to park it right here for a minute. Amen. Let me just pull over right here and park it for an example here, a case study. And if you were here on Wednesday night, good for you. Good for coming to church three times a week, three to thrive, amen? amen. But if you're here Wednesday night, you'll understand this point a little bit more. But even if you weren't here on Wednesday night, you can still understand this point about this ministry that's out there that typifies this baby boomer, bend over backwards, get along with everybody, but nuts to the next generation, burn it all down mentality is this ministry, Born That Way Ministries. Just by the name, you can tell there's something wrong with this ministry. Okay, Born That Way Ministry. The book that it centers around is called Born That Way After All. And it talks about how the sodomites, it, it makes them into a victim. And all over this Born That Way website, there are all kinds of articles telling us how we need to love the sodomite and how we should never even call them a sodomite. I'm using the word sodomite. They call them gay and things like that on the article. There's a whole article on there saying that it's wrong to call them sodomites. And they said, well, what if the, but you'll say the Bible said sodomite. And here's what they say on this Born That Way Ministries. They said, well, even though the Bible calls them sodomites, we shouldn't because it's offensive and it's not edifying. And then they say, well, I know Jesus called people serpents and vipers, but it's okay for him to do it, but it's not okay for us to do it. I thought he left us an example that we should follow in his steps. Yeah. Right? But, but we're supposed to be better than Jesus. Because Jesus was mean and a jerk and rude, according to them. We need to be better than Jesus. We need to be softer and nicer because he was just too mean. I mean, sure, he called people serpents and vipers, but he also walked on water. Are you going to walk on water? Hmm. <laughs> and they said, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the article. And then they said, well, Jesus never commanded us to, to walk on water, and he never commanded us to preach like that. Actually, he did. He said, preach the word, rebuke. Right, right. What do you think rebuke is? It's to sternly tell someone that they're wrong. The Bible says, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Hard preaching in the Old Testament, hard preaching in the New Testament. It's always been God's style of preaching. Rough preaching, hard preaching is biblical. Smooth preaching is for false prophets. That's what the Bible teaches. Every real preacher is a little rough, a little hairy, a little bit harsh. That's what biblical preaching is supposed to be like. But this ministry to, oh, don't call them sodomites. You know, I mean, look, God forbid you'd actually call him a fag or a queer, but they're saying, don't even call him a sodomite. Don't even call him. And, 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 and don't have this us against them mentality. Embrace them. Bring them in. Okay, this ministry is just constantly, it's quoting Gandhi. It's quoting Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, it's just, this is the quote on their website. Eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Quote from Gandhi and Marxist Lucifer King. Okay. A quote that is basically ridiculing the law of God, which said eye for an eye, okay? Ridiculing God's law and saying, oh, that's going to make the whole world. No, it won't, idiot, because they did it back in the days of Moses, and it did not make the whole world blind, fool. Yeah. Quit blaspheming the law of God. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting Amen. the soul. Amen. But this, this 
queer-loving, pandering ministry that's, oh, they're born that way after all, they're born that way, oh, they're poor, poor little sodomite victim. It's all based around this bizarre doctrine. Again, I'm not going to re-preach my sermon from Wednesday night, but a bizarre doctrine that says that, that, oh, these people that are out being with a bunch of other men, men who are out fornicating with other men, women who are fornicating with other women, which the Bible calls vile and filthy, they're actually just, they were born that way because they were born to be eunuchs and they're just confused. He claims they're born with no desire and they're just confused. Well, newsflash, if they're born with no desire, they'd be doing nothing. They wouldn't be with another dude. No man just accidentally ends up with another dude because he had no desire. That's stupidity. That's foolishness. The Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. How much more when you speak that kind of foolishness? They're trying to convince us that homos are actually eunuchs. I mean, what will they think of next? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you got to get my sermon from Wednesday night on Jeremiah 39. But you're going to have to look at a different YouTube channel. I, it was too hot for my main channel because I don't want to get banned. But listen, the supporting ministry, they, if you go to their born that way, .org, they're supporting ministries. Who supports them? This is what it says on the top of the page. The pastors and organizations listed below are friends who understand the truth. Talking about the truth that they're teaching that sodomites are really just poor little confused eunuchs. The pastors and organizations listed below are friends who understand the truth and provide a safe place for those seeking answers. By the way, those seeking answers are pedophiles and sodomites, right. who they're painting as victims, whereas the Bible paints them as wicked, brute beasts, haters of God, full of murder, debate, deceit, malignity. Read Romans 1. Here are some of the names on the list. Dr. Bob Gray from Longview, Texas. He's a leader of the Independent Fundamental Baptist Movement. There are hundreds of pastors, hundreds of Independent Baptist pastors who look up to Dr. Bob Gray Sr., as a leader of the Fundamental Baptist Movement. This is what he's supporting, Born That Way Ministries. Baby boomer for you, the mentality. Dr. Jeff Owens, again, another big name in fundamentalism that people look to as a leader of the Fundamental Baptist Movement. Dr. Jeff Owens, S.M. Davis is another well-known guy that's on here. Uh, another one that I, I haven't heard of a lot of these, um, these uh, queer baits that are listed here. But this guy, Pastor Kenny Baldwin, I've heard of him. I think he goes and preaches in the Sword of the Lord conferences all the time. He's on the list. You know, you can look at the complete list yourself and make sure to never set foot in one of these safe spaces for, for pedophiles. But anyway, it lists all these churches that are the supporting ministries of that movement. And look, here's what they're doing. Look at 1 Kings 16, verse 16. Chapter 16, verse 16. And the people that were encamped heard say, Zimri hath conspired and hath also slain the king. Wherefore all Israel made Omri the captain of the host king over Israel that day in the camp. And Omri went up from Gibbethon and all Israel with him and they besieged Tirzah. And it came to pass when Zimri saw that the city was taken, that he went into the palace of the king's house and burnt the king's house over him with fire and died for his sins which he did, or which he sinned in doing evil in the sight of the Lord, in walking in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin which he did to make Israel to sin. I just, as I was thinking about this generation of preachers that are leading fundamentalism right now, this story just kept coming into my mind. Just burn it all down. Burn it down. Just burn down the house. Let's just make sure that the next generation inherits nothing. Let's just burn it all down. What these people are doing is turning our country into a modern day Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what they're doing to our country. Yeah. And they don't care. They don't care. If they cared, they'd do something to stop it, my friend. If they loved me, if they loved, they talk so much about love, they only love themselves. That's right. Because if they loved me, and if they loved you, and if they loved our children, you know what they'd do? They would try to stop our country from turning in to a modern day Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what they would do if they really loved us. They don't love us. 
Instead, they're just burning it all down. And you know what's going to happen? We're going to have to go build the city somewhere else. Just like in the story where Zimri burns it all down, we have to start our own churches. It should be that our generation would take over the churches from the past. You know, pastors would retire. We would take over the church. We'd already start with 200 people or whatever. We'd continue the soul winning, continue the program. These churches are so corrupt and they're so filled with perversion and wickedness and worldliness and sin. They're not even worth taking over. We ought to just go start our own churches. And not only that, but the people wouldn't even vote in real preachers anymore because they're so used to the smooth things and the watered down preaching. That's right. Because spiritually speaking, the baby boomer generation of preachers is just burning it all down. So what if my grandson's a eunuch? So what if my son's a eunuch? There's peace and truth in my days. That's the mentality. That's what's going on today. Otherwise, explain this, huh? Why don't you explain this crap to me? Huh? Why don't you explain to me why the leaders of the Fundamental Baptist movement are supporting Born That Way Ministries and, oh, don't say sodomites. That's you, you offend me. You offend me with your queer loving doctrine. You offend me with your watered down compromise. You offend me when you bring the police chief and the mayor and the congressman across your pulpit and praise the wicked. And then you criticize the law of God and make fun of it. They make fun of Leviticus 20:13. They make fun of the teachings of the Bible. They wouldn't touch Romans 1 with a 10-foot pole. They're scared of it because they love money. They love possessions. They love boats and RVs and guest homes and everything. You know what? I don't want any of it. I don't want a boat. I don't want a guest house. I don't want an RV. I don't want to own anything. I, I'll take off my coat and get rid of it. I don't even want it. I don't need anything. You know what I want? I want my children to love God. Amen. That's what I want. Amen. I don't want a building. I don't want a chandelier. I don't want a stained glass window. I don't want a steeple. I don't want to own anything. I want my children to love God. And I want them to be able to live in a country where they're not surrounded by filth like Lot, where they have to vex their righteous soul from day to day Amen. with sodomy. That's what I want. That's all I want. That's all I care about. The things of this world are a vapor. And these guys, they just want to cling to everything. Otherwise, explain this. Don't tell me these guys actually believe that homos are actually eunuchs. Nobody's that stupid, friend. I don't believe it for one second. These guys are the Hezekiahs who just want to just basically get along with the sodomites, pitch their tent towards Sodom for evangelism purposes, pitch their tent towards Sodom, go along to get along, comfortable, smooth. They're never in the news. Look, when was the last time a baby boomer preacher was in the news for ripping on the sodomites? You know who's in the news for ripping on them? I am. Roger Jimenez. How old am I? 35. How old is he? 31. Donnie Romero, how old is he? Younger than I am. He was in the news. He had the protesters marching around him. I've seen other young guys get up and preach what needs to be preached. Not these guys, not Bob Gray, not Jeff Owens. Of course, one time Jeff Owens was in the news for a sermon he preached 20 years ago when it was popular, and he promptly apologized. I'm so sorry if I said anything to offend the gay and lesbian community. I don't acknowledge a gay and lesbian community. There's a filthy community, a bunch of perverts and sodomites. You say, well, I don't like this kind of preaching. Well, you know what? Go to Burn It Down Baptist. Go to Burn It Down Baptist with Pastor Free Love, Summer of Love, Hippie. Huh? Pastor Hate Ashbury, right? Down at Summer of Love Baptist. You can go to the Burn It Down Sunday School class and you can learn how homos were born that way after all. Listen to this article, if I can find it. Listen to this article. All right, let's see here. 
Hey, I may have torn apart my own outline, but at least I'm not like Moses where he broke the Ten Commandments, amen, where he shattered them, <laughs> ground up the golden calf and made everybody drink it. Here's an, art here's an article, at least I tear apart my own things and destroy my own pulpit, right? But anyway, um, here's an article from this Born That Way Ministries that Jeff Owens supports and his name's on the website as a, as a safe space for, for homos that Bob Gray, S.M. Davis, these guys support. Help, my child just told me he's gay. Here's the, that's the title of the article. Number one, here's the advice. Number one, make sure your pride's not the issue. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, how dare you feel shame and humiliation that you've raised a reprobate sodomite? Make sure your pride's not the issue. It's not about, and it can't be about you or what people think of you. Many a macho dad has allowed his pride to get in the way of guiding his son. And many parents have cared too much what others would think. This is about your child. Don't let pride get in the way. You know, this reminds me of, you know, I have an uncle by marriage, not by blood, thank God. I have an uncle who's a phony preacher. He's a false preacher of some community church. He's retired now. His, he's the pastor of the church. And his teenage son was wearing makeup and he, because he was really into The Cure. Remember the band The Cure from the 80s? So he's real into The Cure, Generation Xers out there. And so he had make, he would wear makeup and his hair is all punked out and everything. He's going to church like that. He's the pastor's son. And, and here's, what, here's what my uncle said. He said, well, you know, we've just had to ask ourselves, you know, is, uh, uh, why are we against, I mean, is it right for us to be against the way he looks? Because, you know, maybe that's just pride because we're just embarrassed about the way that our son looks. Maybe that's just us embarrassed about the way he looks. No, you need to give your son a whipping. Because no, wearing makeup as a man and, and, and punking out your hair and coming to church like that is not acceptable. And an elder that doesn't know how to rule his own house, how can he take care of the church of God? But that's this mentality. Make sure your pride's not the issue. Point number five, don't preach at them. Don't <laughs> preach at them. They know right from wrong, but they're often in conflict with their feelings. Let the Holy Spirit convict them of any sin without your interference. Yeah, because, you know, don't you hate it when preaching interferes with what the Holy Spirit's trying to do to convict people? <laughs> don't play the Holy Spirit. And I've heard this junk my whole life. Don't play the Holy Spirit. You're not the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit do it. The Holy Spirit is what God uses through preaching because God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Okay, it's preaching that edifies and strengthens and builds and reproves us of sin. Don't play the Holy Spirit. The truth will make them free, not your persuasion. Often parents repel their child from the truth rather than praying them to it. Your kid's already a fag. <laughs> okay. Number seven, don't cut them off. Don't cut them off. They're your child. Celebrate their birthday. Your child just told you they're a sodomite? Celebrate their birthday. <laughs> I mean, look, this is Zimri. He's just burned it all down. Just, I mean, it's like a psychopathic... This is what I see spiritually when I read this and I hear stuff like this all the time from these, these old phony preachers. I just picture a psychotic person running around with lighter fluid just <laughs> Let's just burn it all down! Woo! I'm gonna die anyway! Might as well burn it all down! I mean, it's that crazy, people! Celebrate their birthday. Treat them like your child. Sometimes parents try to punish their child. Imagine that. Sometimes parents try to punish their child by taking away things or not acknowledging them as they once did. Man, my throat is killing me. I got to get through this sermon and I don't want to turn down the volume at all. Somebody got a Ricola for me? I'm going to burn it all down and that's just my throat. 
that's a mistake. God didn't do that to us, so we certainly shouldn't do that to them. And don't make threats either. What are you going to do, punish them? I mean, God never punishes us, right? <laughs> God never threatens us, right? I mean, look, how many times has God threatened us in the Bible? <laughs> huh? Repent, or I'm going to come unto thee quickly, and I'm going to fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Yeah. Isn't that a threat? Yeah. Oh, this one. Oh, man. <laughs> number nine. Don't, number nine, don't talk about it too much. Hey, don't whine. Quit whining about them. Okay, your kid's a, a, a son. Quit whining about it. Don't whine to anyone. Your tongue will lead your spirit. Do not feel like you're bearing the burden of the world. Don't announce it to the church. Sweep it under the rug. All the little queers and sodomites that are in the church, sweep it under the rug. Be like the Catholic church and hide all the pedophiles. That's what they're saying, basically. <laughs> Translation. But what it says, it says, don't announce it to the church. Don't whine about it. Don't tell your friends. Respect the privacy of your child while you're helping them find answers. Number 10, do not believe that their life's over. It's not. Parents can throw away their child when God is preparing them. You know that process where God's preparing your child? You know that, that sodomite phase where they go out and commit abominations with other men? That's just part of the preparation for your child. God's preparing them simply because the parent can't see the possibilities for the child's future. We've had our idealistic view of what their lives would look like. You know, that they'd be straight, for example. What a pipe dream. And by the way, elsewhere on this site, I forgot about this, it said, don't use the word straight because if you use the word straight, you're implying that they're crooked. Did you just hear what I just said? Yeah. Fundamental Baptists are signed on to this website that says, oh, don't use the word straight. You're implying that they're crooked. What? Uh, yeah, that's the mildest thing I would ever say about that death style. Right. Right. Don't imply that they're crooked. What in the world? Number 14, don't ask what you don't want to know. Sometimes it's best to not know what they've done. Many parents cannot deal with the thought of their child having committed same-sex sins. You don't need to know what they've done. You don't want to know. Your responsibility is to help them find the truth and then let God deal with them about what they've done. Many parents have become distraught because of asking what they really didn't want to know. You know, I mean, these idiot parents, they get all distraught, you know, when they find out the, that their kids have committed the worst sins imaginable. It's like, chill out. Hang loose, baby. You know, <clears throat> I get asked this question all the time, and I'm sick of it. It's a stupid question. And usually my policy is just avoid foolish questions. But I get asked this question over and over again because the wicked baby boomers and other wicked people of my generation and other generations, they're constantly coming at you with this. They think it's like this trump card that they're pulling out. Oh, yeah? Well, what if one of your children comes to you and tells you that they're gay? What then? Hmm. And they think that's like a hard question. Now, first of all, let me say this. That will never happen. That will never happen because people don't just accidentally become a sodomite. They become a sodomite by hating the Lord by rejecting the very creator of the universe. Even just the fact that God is the creator, they won't even acknowledge that he even created it. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. I'm bringing up my children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And if I train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he will not depart from it. Amen. I'm not raising sodomites. Would never happen. But let me just answer this question once and for all. If one of my children, and this is like asking if aliens are going to land or if the sky <laughs> turned green. But if somebody came to me and said, if one of my children came to me and said, Dad, I've got something to tell you. I'm gay. Okay. Now, unless he's saying he's happy and in a good mood. But, you know, that's not what they mean. If he came to, because gay just means happy, right? 
We're all gay, amen? amen. We're all happy, right? I'm happy. I'm in a good mood, believe it or not. You should see me, you should see me when I get in a bad mood. But anyway, now I'm usually in a good mood. The joy of the Lord is my strength, amen? amen. But here's the thing. If one of my children, you know why I'm, I'm so happy? Because my children love the Lord. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. But if one, of my, if one of my sons came to me and said, Dad, I'm a homo, I would grab my son and I would hurl him as hard as I could out the front door of my house. Within 10 seconds, he would be hurled out the front door. The door would be slammed shut. He would be cursed in the name of the Lord and told, never come back. You go ahead and quote me on that. Go ahead and put that in your pipe and smoke it. God's not a respecter of persons and neither am I. And I love my children, but I don't love my children more than God. I love my wife, but I love God the most. I love Jesus. First Jesus, then I love my wife, then I love my children, and then I love my brothers and sisters in Christ, and then I love everybody else. That's, that's the chain of of. of of order of, of how I love the people that are the most important to me. But you know what? If, if that, but, but, but what's so stupid about that question is, well, what if your child came to you and said, Dad, you know, I have to confess to you, I've murdered 20 people and they're all stored in my basement right now. Okay. Well, but I'm just supposed to say, well, son, let's celebrate your birthday. <laughs> let's not tell the church. <laughs> You know, right? What? Well, well, don't want to preach at you. And you say, well, how can you compare those two things? Well, they have the same punishment under the Levitical law. Right. Murder and, and sodomy have the same punishment. Okay. But not only that, but you know what? AIDS kills innocent people. Yeah. Babies that are born with it. People who get it through a blood transfusion. These sodomites going around spreading AIDS and filth. Plus, even worse than killing the body is damning the soul. And the sodomite community damns people every day by molesting them and turning them in hatred toward God. Because right. when people get molested, they lash out and hate God a lot of times because they blame God. They blame God that God allowed that to happen to them. It happens all the time. They're damning and destroying and hurting and murdering and doing all kinds of horrific things. But this is the kind of this is the kind of stuff now. This is what Bob Gray and Jeff Owens and S.M. Davis and Kenny Jackson and the rest of them. And you say, how dare you name the names? Well, Paul named the names of Hymenaeus, Alexander, Hermogenes, Phygelus. How do I even know those names? Because Paul pointed out the liars and false prophets of his day. And you know what? Let me tell you something. Somebody needs to take these guys to task. Because you know what? Who else is doing it? Who else is calling out Bob Gray and, and S.M. Davis and Jeff Owens for signing their names to that filth? Who else is doing it? It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to call these people out. Somebody's got to rebuke it. Why? Because hundreds of churches are following them. Hundreds of pastors are following them. Thousands of people are following them. Somebody needs to take that, excuse me, to task. You know, if I start promoting sodomy and filth, take me to task. Mm. Last place, 1 Kings 13. 1 Kings chapter 13. Let me give a quick review of the sermon. And again, don't, don't walk out of here and say, Pastor Anderson hates the elderly. Or Pastor Anderson doesn't respect his elders. You know, I, you know, I, I treat my parents with respect. I love my parents. I honor them. I honor godly pastors. I honor those who are elder than me. I treat them with respect. By default, if I, you know, when in doubt, I'm going to treat them with respect. But when they start preaching sodomy to me in an airport, I'm going to rebuke them sharply. I'm not going to sit there and just let some old lady bully me, you know, about this filth. I'm taking a stand. Somebody needs to tell her what her husband should have told her a long time ago. Or her dad or whoever. Or pastor or whoever failed. They all failed. First King, so, so here's the review real quick. Number one is, in general, the baby boomer generation became kind of a spoiled, rotten generation. Unfortunately, the prosperity of fools will destroy them. 
And, you know, because there was so much artificial prosperity after World War II, which was, you know, an unrighteous war where many tens of millions of people died and, you know, a lot of wicked forces were at work, obviously. That's not of God, you know, the, the deaths of tens of millions of people in World War II. And both sides were wicked, not just the Nazi side. Woo, there I said it. The Soviets were even more wicked. We teamed up with the Soviet Union in World War II. You can go to a museum of World War II and see posters of a Soviet Red Army soldier. And it says, this man is your friend. He fights for freedom. And that was shown to our troops because the Soviets are our friend. They fight for freedom. When the Soviet Union was wicked, communist, murderous, you know, that war was wicked against wicked. Yeah. Wickedness against wickedness. We should have just stayed out of it. There, I said it. Amen. We should have minded our own business. And you say, well, Japan attacked us. Yeah, after we were already against them for two years. Right. Embargoing their country, helping the enemy, training the enemy, giving money to their enemy when we should have just stayed out of it. Yeah. Let Hitler and Stalin destroy each other, amen? Yeah. But we got in on it because we wanted a piece of that financial action. We got in it because of the Jew controllers to get them into Israel and Palestine, and that's a whole other story. You know, the, the baby boomers might be freaked out by that, that statement, but it's the truth. That wicked war created an artificial level of prosperity where the U.S. is able to step in and loan a bunch of money and, and, and sell a bunch of products and export products, and our currency was doing great. Their currencies are all jacked up from the war and everything. We benefited from that. So because of... Growing up in a time where it was easy for just a blue-collar guy, I mean, the 50s and 60s, a blue-collar guy could just pretty much just buy a house, buy a four-wheel drive, buy a boat. I mean, my dad was an electrician. He was just buying house, car, boat, RV, whatever. It was a time of unparalleled prosperity. Now, you'd think that'd make people praise the Lord and thank God for his goodness, but no, no, no. The growing up with that prosperity just made them basically spoiled, unfortunately. So they, they became kind of a spoiled brat generation that, that grew their hair long as men, rebelled against their parents, they cursed their father, they did not bless their mother, they went into the summer of love and Woodstock and fornication and Beatlemania and dope and abortion and divorce and whatever. They burned it all down morally. So that's number one. Number two, the baby boomers, therefore, they don't represent the old paths. Now that they're old, they're still that dope-smoking hippie generation in their heart in many cases. And again, there are exceptions to that. They're godly baby boomers. But because of that, they don't represent the old paths anymore, even though they're old. And number three... They tend to not care about the next generation. They tend to be self-centered. And they're ready to burn it down, rack up a $20 trillion debt. No problem, because it's somebody else's problem. Castrate the grandkids? No problem. Peace and truth in my days, amen? Let's close on this, 1 Kings chapter 13. And I don't have time to read the whole story, so I'm just going to tell you the story for sake of time. In this story... God calls a young man to preach the word of God and he brings him in from a different area. Geographically, he brings him in to Bethel from a different area. This man goes to Bethel and he preaches a hard sermon right to the king. He preaches against the altar at Bethel. He preaches against their false worship and false doctrine. He tears it up. He preaches hard. God performs a miracle and during his preaching, destroys the altar, just breaks in half. So the king is kind of blown away by that. The king invites him over and he says, well, no, 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 God commanded me to preach this sermon and leave. I'm not doing follow-up today. I'm supposed to preach against this altar and I'm not supposed to eat. I'm not supposed to drink. I'm not supposed to spend the night here. I'm supposed to preach the sermon and go home. He's heading home. And as you're reading the story about this man of God, you're thinking to yourself, man, this guy is great. This guy is being used of God. I can't wait to see what, what God does with his life. Verse 11, now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. 
So, of course, because he's an old prophet, he's going to represent the old paths and old-fashioned fundamentalism, right? And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king, them they also told to their father. And their father said unto them, Well, what way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon. And went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said unto me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He said unto him, Well, I'm a prophet also, as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thy house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So he went back with them and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee. Look, we need to stop listening to the old prophet and start listening to the word of God. Amen. If I know what the word of God says, I don't need to know what the old prophet says. Right. Right. I don't need to hear his side. I don't need to hear what he got from the Bible. No, if the Bible says no, it's no. We can't just say, well, we got to listen to the old men. We got to listen to the old prophet. No, no, no. We need to ditch the old prophet and we need to listen to the word of God. Amen. Now, if the old prophet's preaching the same thing, I mean, if this old prophet would have come and said, hey, I loved your message. You're preaching good. You're preaching hard. Keep it up. Get out of here. Don't eat or drink. Do what God said. Amen. And encouraged him. Fine. But what we often see today is the old preacher taking aside the young preacher as myself and trying to tone us down and get us off the path that God has put us on. Hey, God told me to cry against the sodomites. God told me to cry against fornication and adultery and divorce and everything else. God told me to preach against drunkenness and drug abuse. God told me to go soul winning. God told me to call out the false preachers by name. God told me to preach against the Catholicism and Orthodox Church and Mormonism and the Jehovah's Witnesses and Islam and Seventh-day Adventist. Look, God told me to do that and I don't need some older man who's, you know, who's wiser, a little more wisdom, to give me some godly counsel about why I should preach differently. No. The moral of the story is this, my generation, which is the so-called millennial generation or generation X, I'm kind of on that borderline. Our generation of those that are in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, we need to reject completely the advice of the old preachers that are coming from this corrupt generation, unless they're an exception. We need to say, you know what? That generation has failed. It's a failure. Right. The churches are, are going downhill. Right. The independent fundamental Baptist churches, for the most part in this country, are in decline. Right. They're in decline. That movement is past its heyday. It's dying. They're burning it all down. It's gone soft. They're like Solomon, where in their older days, they're going after false gods and where we need to realize that generation is not someone that we want to follow right. by and large and we don't need them we need God and there's nothing wrong with following preachers that are in their 20s 30s and 40s if they're on the old path because being on the old path isn't about your age I mean I was more old-fashioned when I was 24 I started this church I was 24 years old I was more old-fashioned than preachers in their 40s and 50s. It's ironic, but it's true. We need to reject that generation and their teachings, and we need to understand 
they are in a self-destruct mode right now. I mean, this, what we see here is self-destruct. Burn it all down. And so we, we I don't want to go down with them. It's time to start over, folks. And you know what? If this old prophet was a good prophet, why'd God have to bring somebody in from another place? Why'd God have to bring in the young prophet? He could have just told that old guy, go preach against Bethel. He knew that guy would never preach that sermon. Right. He had to bring in another guy. So then the old guy, instead of just sitting down and shutting up, that's what I, you, you say, well, what's your advice to these watered down baby boomers that are so into the love of money and possessions and they're so into being popular and getting along with, with politicians and they're so into being comfortable and safe and security and no risk and they never want to be on the news for preaching too hard? My advice to them is just do us all a favor and just retire yeah. and sit down and shut up and just right. go somewhere and just, we don't want to hear from you. Yeah. Right. Don't you wish the old prophet in this story would have done that? But instead, it's like, oh, well, which way did he go? Ooh, let's go get him and let's ruin him too. Because misery loves company. And then he takes the young preacher and he lies to him and ruins him. You know, so the baby boomers, they have to run their Bible colleges, bring in all the young, hard-preaching prophets and turn them into a bunch of pink shirt-wearing little queer little sissies. Burn it all down. Turn them into a bunch of eunuchs, spiritually. He said in verse 22, But came his back and has eaten bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. And it came to pass that after he'd eaten bread and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass to wit the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him, by the way, and slew him. He died just for disobeying the Lord and just eating a meal with this preacher. He died. A lion slew him. And it says, and by the way, that lion represents the devil because the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Mm -hmm. The devil would love to devour the young preacher, me, you, or any other. So the, the lion came and, and, and devoured him. It says in verse number <clears throat> 24, when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him and his carcass was cast in the way and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass and behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way and the lion standing by the carcass and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, it's the man of God who was disobedient under the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him, yeah, because you lied to him, yeah. <laughs> and hath slain him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. And he spake to his son, saying, Saddle me the ass, and they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God and laid it upon the ass, and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him, and he laid his carcass in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother! And it came to pass after he'd buried him that he spake to his son, saying, When I'm dead, bury me in the sepulcher wherein the man of God is buried. Lay me, lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. After this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way, but made again of the lowest of the people, priests of the high places, and whosoever would, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. You know what this reminds me of? This is the hypocrisy of the old phony preachers who, who they mourn our country. What's wrong with America? We're new. Well, I don't understand why the young preachers don't have any fire in their belly. <laughs> Because you taught them that? You ruined them? Yeah. You watered them? I don't know. It's, it's so terrible. Our country is, is doomed and the Sodomites are taking over. Yeah. When did you preach hard against them? When did you stand up to them? When did you take a public bold stand? Never. It's your fault that the younger generation is destroyed. It's your fault that Jeroboam continues to lead the country down a wicked path but mourn and lament and whine about it. Shut up, it's your fault, you lied to him. If you would've just stayed home, everything would've been fine. 
we need to follow the Lord. The old prophet can sometimes lead us astray. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the fact that we have the word of God to guide us. When man lets us down, when preachers let us down, when leadership lets us down, we've still got the rock of the word of God. It never changes. Romans still one is still in the Bible. No matter what, these old baby boomer prophets are, are, are corrupting doctrine with. We can always go back and just get a sanity check. Yep, Bible still says the same thing. Thank you that the Bible never changes, Lord. Thank you for the rock of our salvation. Thank you for the rock of the sayings of this book. And Lord, I pray that you would do an amazing work. And, and Lord, you're already doing it. That you would do an amazing work with my generation and, and with people that are young, that are willing to reject the path of their wicked fathers and grandfathers and get back on the old-fashioned path of the Bible. And in Jesus' name we pray these things, amen.